As I said, every evening we have a special Hanukkiah. This is the Hanukkiah. Smaller version is right in front of us. And there's a story. Is with each one of these Hanukkiah that belong to the Yad Artifacts Division has a story attached to it. On Friday evening, before Shabbat, it was the eighth night of Hanukkah, December 11th, 1931, Tafresh Tzadik Bet. Rabbanit Poznel, the wife of Rabbi Dr. Akiva Poznel, took this photo of the family Hanukkah Menorah on the window ledge of the family home, capturing the building across the road decorated with Nazi flags. On the back of the photograph, which you have here, Rachel Poznel wrote in German, Hanukkah 5692, which is 1932, she made a mistake, apparently that was when the photograph was developed, death to Judah, death to Judah, so the flag says. Judah will live forever. So the light answers. Rabbi Dr. Akiva Posnell, Doctor of Philosophy from Huntington University, served from 1924 to 1933 as the last rabbi of the community of Kiel in Germany. After Rabbi Posnell publicized a protest letter in the local press expressing indignation at the posters that had appeared in the city, Entrance to Jews forbidden. He was summoned by the chairman of the local branch of the Nazi party to participate in a public debate. The event took place under heavy police guard and was reported by the local press. When the tension and violence in the city intensified, the rabbi responded to the pleas of his community to flee with his wife Rachel and their three children and make their way to Eretz Yisrael. The Posner family left Germany in 1933 and eventually arrived in Eretz in 1934. Before their departure, Rabbi Posner was able to convince many of his congregants to leave as well, and most managed to leave for Eretz Yisrael or the United States. So many years later, Kiva and Rachel Posner's descendants, here's the family, the three children, in the synagogue in Kiev, Kiev continued to light the Hanukkah candles using the same menorah that was brought to Israel from Kiel. In 2005, Shulamit Poznel, Mansbach, donated this original menorah to Yad Vashem on one condition, that every Hanukkah, her family would take back this menorah and use it during the eight days of the holiday. We have with us today Judah Mansbach, the grandson of the Posner family, who has brought this menorah with him together with children and grandchildren to light the candles for the fourth night of Hanukkah. There's a personal here as well. Both you and I go back 46 years. We began our military service in the Anachal Unit of B'nai Akiva Youth on Kibbutz Deliyahu in September 1970. Yuda works as a high school principal and each year tells a story of the family's Hanukkah to all the students and graduates. Today, the tribe of the grandchildren and their spouses, great-grandchildren and their spouses, the next generation after that numbers close to 100 people. May they continue to multiply and grow, forever living and thriving in Israel. I'd like to call up to the stage Yuda and his family to light with us the Hanukkah candles of this fourth night. Yudah.
ערב טוב לכולם, חג אורים שמח, תודה שהזמנתם אותנו. רק משפט אחד, כי לא יטוש השם עמו ונחלתו לא יעזוב. סבא וסבתא שלנו בגרמניה לפני 85 שנה, אין מדינה וגם הם לא גרים במדינה, הם עדיין גרים בגרמניה וכו', אבל הם מזהים אין עתיד ליהודים בחוץ לארץ, מקומם של היהודים בארץ ישראל. ואנחנו היום בארץ ישראל צריכים להשלים ונחלתו לא יעזוב. תשעים צאצאים ברוך השם יש לסבא וסבתא וכולם בארץ ישראל, בכל רחבי הארץ, משתדלים לפתח ולשמור אותה. רק שמח. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו במצוותיו וציוונו להדליק נר של חנוכה
did not give a proper introduction to the Ramadan Children's Harmonica Orchestra. <laughs> this is an orchestra that was created in the memory of Shmuel Gogol, conducted by Kenneth Oshner, the musical director, Alexander Rice. Shmuel Gogol lost his mother at the age of three. He was educated in Yanosh Kocha's orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. Kocha gave him his first harmonica as a birthday gift. When Gogol was deported to Auschwitz, he was stripped of all his belongings, including the harmonica. But he managed to obtain another one from a fellow prisoner in exchange for a portion of food. At Auschwitz, Gogol was assigned to the camp orchestra. He vowed that if he survived the Holocaust, the harmonica remained an integral part of his life. He survived the Shoah and immigrated to Israel and in 1963 established the Ramadan Children's Harmonica Orchestra. We will hear them again and some more melodies that they will they perform for us in their harmonicas. Eddie Bizet. Eddie was a frequent visitor to Yad Vashem and to our international conferences over the years. In March 2005, during the inauguration of our new Holocaust History Museum, he said one of the most profound things that I've ever heard from him. The Holocaust was not man's inhumanity to man. The Holocaust was man's inhumanity to the Jews. I want to introduce Dr. Abraham Allen Rosen, his student, a close friend of Eddie for the past 40 years, to say a few words in his memory. First, let me say Chanukah and thanks to Prime K, to uh, the International School here that I lecture for on a very regular basis, and Yad Vashem more generally, and to you all for venturing here. And uh, these remarks have to be seen in the context of Professor Bizel's own work, which often focused on portraits. Given that it's Hanukkah, we're not permitted to give eulogies per se. So it's really in the spirit of a portrait of my teacher, our teacher, from a very subjective point of view. And as uh, Ron King mentioned, uh, he had the privilege of knowing Professor Wiesel for almost 40 years, first as a student, then as a doctoral student, then a um, teaching assistant for some eight years, and uh, eventually as a colleague and a friend. For some 25 years, my teacher, Elie Wiesel, Satsang, and I spoke by phone every Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the, Jew the new Jewish month. The idea came up because we were meeting in his New York apartment and took leave of one another by saying, a good chodesh, chodesh tov, good start to the month. I suggested that if we didn't have the opportunity to speak in person on every Rosh Chodesh, at least we could try to do so by phone. He characteristically responded, great, and we did. And that was his way. I would make a suggestion and he would answer in the affirmative, celebrating his students' initiative. Rosh Chodesh would loom up and wherever his remarkable travels took him, 
He would try to get back to me within a few days. Sometimes the conversation would be brief, but intense. One conversation in the winter month, this month, that we're in in the Jewish calendar of Kislev, I pointed out that the day's Torah reading spoke of Yaakov Avinu, the patriarch Jacob, his dream of a ladder stretching from the ground toward heaven, and it added, is there any greater episode in the Torah, any more splendid image? So Professor himself quoted the relevant Hebrew verses from memory, and then took the episode and image to the next level. What does it mean, he said, we are each other's ladder. We help each other by being the other's ladder. He was surely mine, but he was telling me, as he told all of his students, I and we were surely his. He was my ladder, lifting me beyond what was taken for granted, searching for what he called the panemius of the panemius, the inner dimension of the inner dimension. Around the time of my 60th birthday, two years ago, I queried him, what should come next? His response, think higher. Everything should be connected with what is above. For example, God puts on talus and tefillin every day, just like we do below. We, too, had to connect, he was saying, what was below to what was above. After my son was born 20 years ago, Professor Wiesel instructed me that essential, the essential thing to do was that on the day before his bris milah, to speak to my son about what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be descended from Avram Avinu, from Abraham the patriarch, whose signature he would bear, and whose mission he would have the privilege of continuing and carrying out in the world. I did, as my teacher said, enveloping my weak old son in the story of the Jewish people. Not only Rosh Chodesh, but other significant dates punctuated our conversation. Some three years ago, during the summer, I asked him, so here we are in the week before Tisha B'Av, the day of mourning, the day of commemoration of the destruction of the temples and the exile of the Jewish people. What do we need to know about this? And this became a way that I queried him again and again of what do we need to know, what's essential? He responded, the Tishba of this day of mourning, is only one day a year, and that we have to prevent the other days from becoming Tishba us. I responded, yes, and then to work to bring joy to the other days? Yes, he replied, true joy, simchas be'emes, and continued, we have not just one Megillah, Eicha, the Book of Lamentations, but rather five Megillah, five that we read on the holidays so that we don't live every day as Tisha so that we don't live every day in mourning. Dates and calendars were also my entry to asking him about Auschwitz and Buchenwald, the camps that he was compelled to endure during the war. It was unusual for us to discuss his wartime experience, not because it was off limits, but rather because he was so generously insistent on hearing about me, 
He would always query when I called or came to his office, how is your life? Is it good? Or do you have any special worries? Or in one phone conversation, which was typical of many, Chodesh Tov, tell me, how are you? And I responded, Baruch Hashem, thank God, fine, and you, Baruch Hashem, but you, tell me about you. So I responded, I'm writing, teaching, lecturing. And he responded, all of those things at one time, teasingly. And continue to, to inquire in ways that matter. How is your parnasa? Do you want me to do anything to help? He was ready to do anything, and over the years did, both in ways I personally knew of and in ways behind the scenes. Yet there were times when one of us would turn the conversation to the war. Do you remember, I asked him, do you remember seeing a Jewish calendar in Buchenwald? I asked this because my research in my the book that's uh, due to come out next year, God willing, is on Jewish calendars during the war, so I would ask him about his experience, get his advice constantly. Like all my questions, no matter how arcane or self-centered, my teacher took this one with the utmost seriousness. I remember vaguely seeing one, he said, but I didn't need it because Menasha knew it all. Menasha referred to Rabbi Menasha Klein Zatzal, the great Torah sage, the Admor of Umvar, who five years Professor Witzel Sr. had been his companion and mentor in the concentration camps, in the post-war youth centers in France, and later in life as a weekly study partner. Menashe was one of those who epitomized the power of Torah to radiate light to the world, even in Buchenwald. And Professor Witzel, brought forth just so lyrically what this power of Torah that Rabbi Menashe embodied could be, saying, incredible what the rabbis did. To think of how the Torah relates to every situation. There's not a situation in life that goes untouched, public, private, married life, everything. What does that mean, I asked. That means that Torah can reach anywhere, any place, any situation. It has already done that. That's what the rabbis have given to us. Eventually, for Rabbi Menashe himself, Professor Wiesel dedicated a yeshiva in Rabbi Menashe's Jerusalem Study Center, not just a few miles from here in the community of Ramot, dedicated to the memory of his father, Shlomo Wiesel Zatzal. I knew, continued Professor Wiesel, I knew Menashe was sick and had been including his name in my prayers every morning. This was shortly after Rabbi Klein's passing in 2011. That day, however, somehow I forgot to include his name. Later, I received a phone call telling me <coughs> Menasha had passed away early that morning. It was just like a Hasidic story, my teacher concluded, bringing meaning and sense to an experience of profound loss. And that was my teacher's way whether on our Rosh Chodesh conversations, or in the classroom, or in his office, wherever it would be. Through study and dialogue, meeting in person, or speaking over the phone, nothing could have pleased him more than to nurture his students, helping us cope with sadness, suffering, and death, filling us with the joy of his care, concern, 
and love of learning and people, and to show us what we could become. I knew where you were going, he said. I knew where you were going even then, before you knew, which is only natural, he shared with me some 35 years after we had first met. How did he know by that time, 35 years later, I didn't need to ask? Two years ago, at this time of year, I asked him, what is important to know about Hanukkah? Professor Kuzel responded, it's such a small candle, such a small, humble, forlorn candle. Yet, to light a candle changes everything. And he ended that conversation so characteristically. I miss you. I would like to see more of you. But we've solved bigger problems. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And I'm going to call up the Harmonica Orchestra again, and they're going to entertain us with some more of this of their songs.